Hi guys, welcome to this revision summary video for everything that you need to know on extracting metals and reactivity. The first part of the video then is going to have a look at how we know how reactive a metal is. Now, how do you work out how reactive a metal is? You look at their reactions, and there are three different types of reactions you can look at. The first one being reactions with acids. Now, if you take any metal and react it with an acid, nice and simply, you'll get your salt and you'll get hydrogen gas. Now, when hydrogen is given off, you will see bubbles. Nice and simply, the more bubbles you get, the more reactive a metal is. And from my reactivity series on the left here, you would see the most bubbles with potassium, you'd see some bubbles with magnesium, and you'd see very few, if any, with copper, and then your unreactive ones like gold, you wouldn't see any bubbles at all. The second type of reaction you can look at is with water, and in particular cold water. Now, if you take any metal and you react it with water, you will either get a metal hydroxide or a metal oxide, and again, you'll get hydrogen gas. Once again, the more bubbles you get, the more reactive it is. Potassium, you're going to see lots of bubbles, but magnesium, you're not going to see any. The reason for that is magnesium isn't reactive enough to react with cold water. So from that, you know that calcium upwards in this reactivity series are my really reactive metals. And then magnesium down to iron are less reactive. And to make those react, you need to actually react it with steam. So you take water, you heat it up, and turn it into a gas. When you do that, you'll form an oxide, in this case magnesium oxide, and then you'll get your hydrogen bubbles. The third type of reaction you can look at is displacement reactions. Now nice and simply here, the more reactive metal is always going to swap places with the less reactive metal to end up as part of the compound. So for example, if I take copper sulfate and react it with magnesium, you can see on the left, magnesium is more reactive than copper. So copper is the least reactive one. The more reactive one wants to be part of the compound, so they will swap around. And you'll end up with magnesium sulfate and then copper left on its own. So the more reactive one will always end up as part of the compound. Usually you'll see a color change. If you see a color change, you'll know that it's more reactive. The next part of the video is going to go into a little bit more detail on displacement reactions and in particular how those displacement reactions show redox, which is reduction and oxidation. Now this is only in the higher section, so if you're not doing the higher paper you can skip past this and move on to the next part. So if we have a look at the displacement reaction we just talked about, which is copper sulphate reacting with magnesium and forming magnesium sulphate and copper. You can see here I've got my state symbols of aqueous, for my solutions, my sulfates, and solid for my metals. What you need to be able to do is tell me where oxidation and reduction are occurring in these reactions. Remembering oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So there are a few steps you can follow. The first one, separate out the ions and remove the spectator ions. The spectator ions being the ions that are exactly the same on both sides. So if we have a look at this, we've got copper and we've got sulfate. You should remember a sulfate is SO4 2 minus, therefore copper has got to be Cu2 plus because we've only got one of it. Magnesium is a solid, so we don't change that into its iron at the moment. On the right hand side, magnesium is now part of the compound, it is now ionic, it's in group 2, so it becomes Mg2 plus. Our sulfate doesn't change, so that stays as SO4 2 minus. And then copper has now become the solid, so we put Cu with S in brackets. So as you can see from both sides of this equation, the only things that are the same are our SO4 2 minus ions, our sulfate ions, so we remove them and rewrite it. Step two is to show the change, so the change in charge. So if we start off with copper, that's going from Cu2 plus to Cu. And then magnesium is going from Mg to Mg2 plus. And then number three, what you've got to do is find out how many electrons have been lost or gained. Again here, you need to remember, if something is positive, it's lost electrons. So copper 2 plus has no electrons in the outer shell and has lost two electrons. It's going back to a copper atom. If it's Cu2 plus, it means you've added two electrons on. So therefore, I add electrons, and therefore, that appears on the left-hand side of the arrow. So it's Cu2 plus plus 2e minus goes to Cu. Magnesium, on the other hand, has gone from 
a normal magnesium atom, it's in group two, so two electrons in the outer shell, two Mg2+, plus, so a magnesium iron with no electrons there. So what we can say now is copper has gained two electrons, so it has been reduced, and magnesium has lost two electrons, so it has been oxidized. Next section, extracting ores. So what are ores and how can we extract metals from them? So nice and simply, an ore is a rock that contains enough metal to make a profit when you extract it. You've got two types of ore. You've got high grade, which means you'll get lots of profit, and low grade, you'll get little, if any, profit. So we now know that an ore is a rock that contains a metal, and we need to get those metals out of the ground, so how do we do it? First of all, we take our unreactive metals. They are silver and gold. Because they're unreactive, it means they're found uncombined. It means they don't react, so all you have to do is dig them out. So if you're asked, how do you extract silver and gold? You dig them out because they're unreactive, they're found uncombined. The ones that are less reactive than carbon, so that's where this line is here, so zinc, iron, tin, and copper, they have to be reduced or heated with carbon. So it's a displacement reaction. You add carbon in, you heat it, and what will happen is your carbon will react with the oxygen in the ore, leaving you with your metal on its own. Now the benefit of that is it's cheaper than the third way of extracting them, which is electrolysis, which I'll come on to in a minute. So for example, if you take copper oxide, you react it with carbon, it will make copper and carbon dioxide, leaving you with your copper metal. Third way of extracting then, that is for your more reactive metals, the ones that are more reactive than carbon. For these ones, you have to use electrolysis. You can't heat with carbon. The reason for that being is you put it in potassium, sodium, they're more reactive than carbon, therefore they will not be displaced by the carbon. So for example, with your electrolysis, you take aluminium oxide, you melt it, you turn it into a liquid, you do your electrolysis on it, and you'll end up with aluminium and oxygen. Now it's important to remember both of these reactions are reduction reactions where the oxygen is removed. And they're both used for obtaining metals from high grade ores. When it comes to getting them from low grade ores where you're not going to make as much of a profit, there are two different techniques which are bioleaching and phytoextraction, which is what this next part of the video is looking at. Right, let's start off with bioleaching. Nice and simply, if you're bioleaching, it means you're using bacteria. The clue is in the name. Now, the main example you need to know is copper sulfide, CUS. When you use bacteria, it will break that down into a copper solution. That solution is called a leachate. Once you have done that, you add scrap iron to that solution and you get a displacement reaction. So you take iron from a junk heap, you scrap iron, you add it in, and what will happen is your copper will be produced, your copper metal. The benefit to this method is it doesn't produce any harmful gases, it doesn't damage the landscape, and it works at low temperatures, so it'll work pretty much anywhere. However, it takes a long time, it's really slow, and it can produce toxic chemicals. So although there are no harmful gases, it can produce toxic chemicals and things like sulfur dioxide. The second way to extract your low-grade ore is phytoextraction. And again, you probably can figure out from the name, that's to do with plants. So what we do, is we take a plant, we make it grow, and it will absorb any metals in the soil. When we then burn that plant, the ashes contain the metal. And again, we can use displacement reactions to fully collect that metal. Now, the benefits of this, it doesn't produce harmful gases and it doesn't damage the landscape, just like using bioleaching. But it can also get metals from contaminated soil. That's a massive, massive benefit. However, there are downsides again. It's also slow and it's weather dependent. If you haven't got the climate, you can't grow the plants. If you can't grow the plants, you can't get the metal out of the ground. And it can also be more expensive than using electrolysis at times. So you have to weigh up the benefits and the consequences of using either method. And that brings this revision summary video to an end. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.